Hello, Graham. Welcome back. Hi, Emiliano. Welcome back yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any past conversations with we, we discussed um, Frege's uh, project um, to reduce the whole of uh, mathematics to to logic, and uh, we discussed how mathematicians had already successfully uh, managed to reduce other branches of mathematics to uh, number theory, to, to arithmetic, and, uh, and to complete the dream, uh, Frege, of course, attempted um, to reduce arithmetic itself down to uh, uh, logic, right? And, and uh, in contrast with uh, what Kant would have thought, that uh, arithmetic is uh, an, a synthetic domain uh, of, uh, of knowledge, the, the idea there is that if you couldn't reduce arithmetic to logic, you would have um, actually found it uh, uh, in a secure way, the whole of uh, mathematics. And, and um, the, the, the trick in that case uh, seemed, well, in, in some way or another, you must uh, uh, talk about sets, right? And, and, uh, and, uh, and Frege's uh, uh, trick to uh, conceive of sets in a, uh, as logical uh, constructs was to conceive of them as the extension of concepts. And uh, we discussed how Russell pointed out that this uh, didn't go anyway, and, and because it contained a, a, a contradiction. So if logicism uh, was to survive, uh, something had to be done. And, and uh, between 1910 and 1913, Russell, together with his colleague uh, Whited, wrote uh, the Principia, and um, which are, in a sense, a Bible of uh, logicism. And, and I would like you to tell us what, what they succeeded in doing and uh, what kind of a conception of uh, logicism uh, emerged out of their work and how it differs from Frege's conception. Yeah. Okay, well, you're right that Frege's, Frege and Russell uh, were logicists in the sense that they thought you could reduce some mathematics to logic. Um, Whitehead, I think, was just only ever a, a technical guy at this stage of the proceedings, so I'm not sure that he had a philosophical view then. Um, there is a difference between Frege and Russell because Frege thought that you could reduce arithmetic and analysis and so on to logic. He, he thought, if I remember right, that geometry is synthetic. Um, whereas Russell's claim was more ambitious. Russell um, thought that you could reduce all mathematics to logic, including geometry. Um, and uh, if I, again, if I remember right, well, there are only three volumes in Principia which were published. There was a fourth that was slated, and I think that was due to be written by Whitehead, um, in which uh, geometry was reduced to, to, to set theory. Um, that, that was certainly never written. Um, so that part of the project remained incomplete, as it were. Yeah. However, um, that's sort of a side issue, because the question is whether, even in the first three volumes, Russell and Whitehead succeeded in reducing arithmetic analysis and so on to logic. Uh, and they had the problem of um, the inconsistency of set theory to deal with. So it's true that Frege thought he was reducing arithmetic to logic, but he did have axioms which were effectively about sets, um, but they looked kind of general enough to be the sort of thing that logicians could deal with. Yeah. Um, because of Russell's paradox, uh, you could no longer accept these axioms, or at least 
you could no longer accept these axioms if you apply classical logic, that is sort of Frege Russell logic. So you have to change your set theoretic axioms. And it's not at all obvious how to do this. So this is a problem that Russell struggled with for a number of years. Uh, I mean, he discovered his paradox in the early years of the 20th century, and I don't think he found a solution that satisfied him until about 1908. And in his autobiography, um, he tells us that he was living in Bloomsbury in London at the time, I think. And there were many days when he would get up, have breakfast, go and sit in his study with a blank piece of paper in front of him. And at the end of the day, the paper was still blank. So, you know, this was a tough issue. Um, but around the sort of, uh, between 1905 and 1908, he plays with various ideas. Um, and the one that sort of satisfies him eventually, the one that appears in Principia, is called type theory. Now, type theory itself can be formulated in various different ways. Um, let, let's take the simple version first. Um, the thought is that um, you've got to rank mathematical objects in a hierarchy. So at the ground level, you have maybe just ordinary concrete objects. Then the uh, next level up, you have sets of those, and then sets of sets of those, and then sets and sets of those, and all the, all the way up, whatever that means. Um, so you take it as uh, a given that sets have this hierarchical structure. Um, and if you dig your heels in and insist that, then um, you can avoid Russell's paradox because uh, according to Russell, you can't quantify over all these sets, okay? Um, what you can do is quantify only over sets of some level. Um, so if you want to say that a set of level n is a member of set of level n plus one, you've got two times of variables, those subscripted by n, those subscripted by n plus one, and you can say things like, Xn is a member of Xn plus one. No, but if you look at you know Russell's paradox, you need to say that X is a member itself or not a member itself. And this is just ruled out by the syntax. So you can't even formulate Russell's paradox. It turns out to be ungrammatical. Um, so this was Russell's solution. Um, it has a number of unlovely features. Um, the first is that you've got this reduplication um, of levels. So if your aim is to construct numbers, you're going to get an infinite repetition. You're going to have numbers at level, I think the first level they appear at is level three. Then you're going to have the same, like well, have numbers at level four and five and six. So you've got this infinite reduplication. Um, it's not clear that's a knockdown problem, but it's certainly, as I say, unlovely. Um, another more worrying feature is this. A nice aspect of Frege's account was that you're actually able to prove that there's an infinite number of objects. So you can, you got, you can do this kind of argument. Take an object, then take its singleton, and the singleton of that, and the singleton of that, and so on. That's going to be an infinite number of different sets, okay? So with a bit of fiddling, you can turn that into a proof that there's an infinite uh, set in, in Frege's theory. Um, you cannot do this in Russell's theory. I mean, you can have an object, it's singleton, it's singleton, but it's singleton, and so on, all the way up. But this, is, this, this whole bunch of things um, isn't, a, isn't a set of any particular type. It goes through all the type hierarchy. And so um, there's no way in Russell's system you can prove there's an infinite number of things. And if you can't do that, then you can't do mathematics. Um, so Russell was forced to take as an axiom something called the axiom of infinity, which is essentially an axiom that there's an infinite number of objects at, at the ground level. And if you're thinking of those as um, physical objects, then um, it's not clear that's true. 
But even worse, it doesn't look like to be a fact of logic. I mean, that, you know, there's a logically possible world in which there's only one object. So this was, this was, a, a, this was one of the problems for him. Um, he seemed to have to appeal to axioms which were not logical. There's a, a third problem, which is more technical. Um, this wasn't the only axiom of a non-logical kind that Russell seemed to need. But the reason he needed it was because the system of type theory that he was dealing with is not quite as simple as I've suggested. Um, he wanted to solve not just the set theoretic paradoxes, but also the semantic paradoxes like the liar paradox. Now, if you want to do that, this set theoretic structure on its own is not good enough. Um, what you've got to do is take into account not only the level of sets, but the level of, of how things are defined, the specification of a set. Um, and you've got to form those into a hierarchy as well. Um, and this makes the structure much more complex. This is sometimes called the ramified theory of types. Um, and if you try to work in a ramified theory of types, it messes up a number of logical, a number of mathematical proofs. Um, because when you give the definitions of sets, they tend, they, they, they turn out not to have the right level. So you need an axiom to say, well, okay, this thing, it, it, you can't show it has the right level, but you, you know, we take it as an axiom, there is something of the right level. Um, this is called the axiom of reducibility. Um, and again, Russell was not happy with it. Um, the, so this was another problem that he faced. Now, um, there's a bit of interesting history here because when early logicians and philosophers took up Russell's work, one of them was Frank Ramsey, a Cambridge philosopher, not mathematician, who died very young, at the age of 28, I think. He would have been one of the great philosophers, logicians of the 20th century, had he lived. But um, he is certainly, he was one of the very few people that Wittgenstein would actually con condescend to speak to. Anyway, uh, what, what Ramsey did was say, look, uh, Bertie, um, you don't need the ramified theory. The simplified theory is good enough for your purposes. So just get rid of the ramification. We go back to simple types that you don't need an axiom of reducibility. And that's great. So in a sense, that solved the problem. Um, although to do this, Ramsey had to admit that this structure would not deal with the paradox of self-reference such as the liar. And so Ramsey had to divide the paradoxes of self-reference into kind of the set theoretic and the semantic. And uh, so, th so the cost of sticking just with the simplified theory was you had to do something else with the semantic paradoxes. And, and you know, Ramsey was well aware of that. He just said, well, you know, these are different kinds of paradoxes, end of story. So that's a rather long answer, I'm afraid, but that's the way it went. What kind of a view of the foundations of mathematics emerges out of it. I mean, for example, the type theory uh, doesn't appear to be logical in the same sense in which the other axioms uh, uh, are, right? Is, doesn't it spoil the, the purely, the dream of uh, grounding, uh, founding uh, arithmetics on purely logical terms? Frankly, I think the answer is yes. Um, there were some logicians after Russell who sort of endorsed logicism. Uh, Carnap at one time is an obvious example, although he gave it up in later years. Um, but Russell's prevarications aside, it, it's pretty clear that let, let's assume you can reduce logic, uh, so you can reduce arithmetic to a set theory. The axioms we need to do that really don't look, at least they, some of the axioms really don't look like logical axioms. So logical effect, logicism effectively kind of folded in the 19, well, it is pretty much gone by the 1930s, I think. <laughs>